get started, I might be late on this. Um, thank you for coming. My name is, my name is Melinda, and I've not seen quite a few of you before. Um, and today we've got um, Anne Boran, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, it can be Boran or Boran. Okay, that's fine. Yep. Um, now, Anne hasn't really been to library before, in fact, it's her first trip to library. So, um, and you can tell that lots of things she's going to talk about today relate quite significantly to the stuff that we've got in our collection. So it was actually Stuart Walsh, who I think some of you know, recommended that I um, do a talk for us. And I think it was a really great recommendation. It was like a fascinating talk and a fascinating book as well. Um, so Anne was a professor at the University of Chester, yeah. is that right? Um, and is now retired and has been researching um, where she grew up and the legacy of her father, who was an activist. But I won't say any more because it's when I talk, hopefully. And we'll have some time for questions afterwards. You're more than welcome to come across some cup of tea afterwards in the main library as well. Um, and that's it. Okay. okay. Well, it's lovely to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, mining and social change in the Castle Comer coalfield, which hopefully you, you might have heard of, but all will be explained. Um, first of all, it, it involves mainly it centered around my father and the miners who were, let's say, who challenged the power structures uh, very strongly, particularly around the 1930s. Okay. Um, so I'll lead you into the story. First of all, we'll have a look at location. Um, and the location, of course, is the Leinster coalfield here, okay? And that area of the Leinster coalfield to the north of County Kilkenny, bordering on Leash and Carlow. <clears throat> and that was an area occupied by the Wanisford estate, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. And this is a map of the area. So here you've got the town of Castlecomer and the collieries that stretch out northwards um, towards the counties of Leash and Carlow. Um, now here you can see some of the mine seams. This was the Jarrow seam. And this area here, uh, the last section of the Jarrow seam was being exploited at the beginning of the 20th century. And you had there Jarrow 7, Vera, Montine, Rockball, were the particular pits um, that were being mined at the beginning of the 20th century. You also had what was called a Skahana seam, um, the west of which was exploited in the first decades of the 20th century but then production centered on the on the deer park which is here which was a major big large mine which continued production right up to the closure in 1968 um, and this is uh, deer park uh, pit okay So the background to the area was, as I mentioned, it was part of the Wanusford estate. Um, and uh, the Wanusford family had a history that stretched back to the 17th century. In 1633, uh, Christopher Wanusford was invited by um, the deputy, Lord Deputy of Ireland uh, to come to Ireland to uh, be masters of the role. This was Thomas Wentworth. Um, he accepted the invitation and he uh, moved to Ireland. And in 1639, he took possession of 22,000 acres of that North Kilkenny land, which formerly belonged to the O'Brennan clan. Um, they held on to that land right up to the 20th century. And at the turn of the century, um, there was a lot of pressure to, for land reform. So they sold the, their acreage to the Land Commission and it was sold on to former tenant farmers of the Wanisfords. So that became an area that was dominated by small farms and of course by mines. So the ones who held on to the mines in the 20th century and that was their source of wealth 
after losing the land. Okay. So in in terms of the area we're looking at, then you had a combination of small farmers with holdings between five and fifty acres. They were holdings that um, were hardly sufficient to sustain families. So most of the farmers depended on the mines to supplement their earnings. And they worked in the mines either as miners or as um, carters. In the area also you had traditional coal miners whose families, where, where for example, sons always followed their fathers into the mines at age 14. And they had a, a very close relationships, a very cohesive group, um, the miners were, um, because of their dependence on a very dangerous industry, subject to so many accidents, etc. They depended on each other, really, sometimes for survival. The area also sustained small businesses, mainly shopkeepers, pubs, in the town and also throughout the collieries. So when I grew up, there was a pub every, I don't know, half mile or so. And this was part of the network of um, support probably for miners and of course supporting business. As they came home from work, they often dropped into the pub to wash the, the, the coal dust uh, <laughs> from their mouths, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so, in terms of um, the social status of the area, then the miners probably came at the bottom. Uh, I'll give you a couple of quotations that captures this. Um, the first comes from a descendant of one of the farmers. Uh, so he said that the workers had hard cash, farmers had property and no cash. At times, they, the farmers, dependent on farming, may have been hungry, not able to afford meat. But there was a snobbery or pride in the land, even though the whole economy depended on the mines. And he said, dirty pound notes supported the shopkeepers. The second quotation comes from Tom Brennan Rowe, who became a very important um, labor leader in the area, together with my father um, during the first half of the, the 20th century. Um, and he said they had nothing, but they still looked down on us, was how he put it. And, and he felt because they were expected to leave school at age 14, the miners, and I know this for myself as I grew up, the boys, when they, we reached 14 in class, the boys went into the mines, most of them, not all of them, um, and the girls could go on to secondary school. You know, it was expected and facilitated their entrance into the mines. Farmers tended to try and protect their sons from going into the mines. They pushed them further to education, maybe a bit further afield, etc. Um, so that was the social relations of the area. Um, and I will just take a look at what was happening in this first half of the 20th century. There was early attempts to organize, to unionize in 1907 in the coal field, um, uh, inspired by the Miners' Fe Federation of Great, Great Britain. And also in 1919, um, under the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. Um, there were two key thinkers um, that, that uh, had strong influences in Ireland. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century. One was Jim Larkin, who founded the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, um, who had his roots in British trade unionism, um, but was a bit of a maverick himself. Um, he, um, he, he founded the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in 1909, um, was quite a strong militant, also was for um, uh, solidarity strikes and had ambitions to create a big union uh, with workers from uh, many enterprises, uh, not single ones. Um, 
Now, James Connolly was uh, a, an interesting thinker. He was also socialist and communist. So was Larkin. And um, he articulated very well the idea uh, for Irish people at the time of combining socialism and nationalism. Of course, there was a big thrust for independence in Ireland um, in, in the first half of, of the 20th century, or the, the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, so his idea centered more around a workers republic uh, where um, workers where, where, for example, you didn't change, just change your masters. As he said, you changed the army uniform from red to green, but uh, something radical should change within society and the workers should be at the heart of this new Ireland. That was his idea around independence. So he was quite inspiring. And with, with uh, Larkin, both of them worked within the trade union movement. And of course, Connolly took part in the 1916 Rising and he was shot. So he became uh, quite, quite sanctified in relation to his socialism in Ireland. Uh, my father, Nixieborn, was born in 1904 and, and he was very influenced by uh, Connolly. Um, now, there were limited options, as you can imagine, in the coal fields at the time. He could go into farming. I guess his father had managed to get 31 acres during the land reform period. Um, but he was also a coal carter, and he perfectly combined the need for farming and revenue for the mines uh, within the area. He, he was one of those people who depended on the mines too. Um, he, he could have gone into mining and of course he could have emigrated. They were kind of the options, uh, but he picked the church. So he was recruited by um, the De La Salle brothers from Castletown, which was, uh, it was um, in Ireland, as you can imagine, on the Catholic Ireland. Um, it was always a, a thing of status if you had somebody within the church. So he was recruited at age 12 to go to their juniorate in Castletown County Leash um, and uh, to become sort of a trainee teacher within the church. He lasted two years there, but what it gave him was a love of education and reading, which, which carried him through life. Um, then he returned to the mines, age 14, and uh, he went to work as um, first gunning a tram and then um, managing pumps um, at age 14. Um, it was a period of immense conflict, of course. Uh, he went into the mines 1918. And of course, 1918 was the start of the War of Independence in Ireland. So there was a lot of agitation going on, both in the sphere of labor and in the sphere of working towards independence, of uprooting the British as they, as they would have thought. Um, so there was uh, the setting up of brigades and battalions and, and uh, companies uh, throughout the country. And also in this area uh, that we're looking at, the Casacoma Coalfield, there was a North Kilkenny Brigade uh, with 11 companies um, that was spread throughout the collieries. And these companies were made up of miners and farmers and uh, shopkeepers, etc., who all took a part in um, so disrupting life for what they regarded as the occupying forces. So there were ambushes and uh, burning of royal um, irish constabulary barracks and um and so forth a, a quite a violent period um and in the mine it was interesting because the miners there was a military side to the, this independence movement that regarded sometimes you trade union activities as been disrupting the main goal, which was independence. 
But the miners, of course, want to change along the line, perhaps, of Connolly's thinking that it shouldn't just be about a military achievement, it should be about changing society. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, in 1921, when Monisford um, lowered their wages because war subsidies um, had been um, withdrawn, he lowered the miners' wages. So the miners uh, went on strike, this under the Irish Transport and General Workers Union now. And uh, they marched into Kilkenny and they listened to um, radical speeches about taking over the mines and um, uh, running them themselves and getting rid of imperialism and it was very fiery stuff. And to emphasize uh, uh, to put their point, they kidnapped two of the mine managers and they kept them hidden for two months. And it was interesting that the mine owner, Walsford, went to the IRA to, ask, to try and get his, his men released. Uh, and they didn't approve, actually, of this action because, of course, the whole economy of the area depended on the mines, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and that, that action was followed up. They did release them after two months and some measure of arbitration was brought in. They got nothing really out of the strike. Uh, so it was just another failure after a series of um, strike failures over the previous, uh, say, 10, 20 years. Always failed. Um, Wonsford was, he prided himself on not giving in to miners. Um, <clears throat> so, um, then the Carters decided that they were going to have a go. So they cut, um, there was an aerial ropeway that carried coal from, uh, I showed you that tail end of the Jarrow Seam. Uh, of course, got its name from Newcastle, didn't it? That Jarrow Seam, yeah. Um, it, it, it brought coal from the outlying mines through to Deer Park, where it was, there was, they created a central depot. And then it would be put through the screens and loaded on a train. There was a new connection out to Deer Park that would take the coal uh, by train to the cities, to, to Kilkenny, and from there onwards to various parts of the country and could be abroad. Um, so the Carters felt that this was going to undermine their livelihoods because they carried coal around the neighborhood and also to the towns around. Um, so they cut the aerial ropeway and of course um, the mines all, they came to a standstill and they did this twice. So the IRA actually put them under uh, martial law, lockdown in the neighborhood so they couldn't leave from 10 o'clock till 5 in the morning. Um, so you can imagine the levels of disruption that were going on uh, in the area during this period from say 1918 to 1921, 22. And as you might know, the treaty uh, was signed in 1921, yeah? And uh, it wasn't uh, an easily accepted treaty for some of the IRA. So it split them in two and they dissolved um, fairly quickly, within a year into civil war. And because there had been so, so much disruption in the mines and so much um, closure over from 1921 to 22, there was a lot of unemployment. So my father, who had now reached 18, uh, and several of the miners, they joined up with the newly formed Free State Army in Kilkenny. Okay, so we come to his failed revolutionary period and the Civil War. So he had just signed up there when, for example, um, Civil War was uh, created and he was sent off to fight to Tipperary, which was a hotspot of activity 
a Republican activity. So the, the anti-treaty fac faction was called Republicans, and of course the pro-treaty were free state. Yeah. Um, so he found himself in the middle of a, a war um, fighting against others that he had quite a lot of sympathy for, etc. Um, and as the, the civil war progressed, um, antagonisms were accentuated, particularly with the killing of one of the, the signers of the treaty, who was Collins, Michael Collins. He was killed in an ambush. Um, and this, of course, was followed up very quickly in September by, um, by uh, a Public Safety Act, which created military tribunals that could condemn uh, anybody found with arms, Republicans found with arms, uh, to death, or could condemn anyone who switched sides to death, or anyone who aided and abetted Republicans in their fight to death. So this was quite a shocking reality because of the fact that these had been comrades at arms at one period, and now they were fighting each other. Um, and um, to complicate uh, my father Nixie's life, of course, he decided he was so shocked by this development that he switched sides. He walked off a night's watch and he went to join. Dan Breen was a famous fighter in Tipperary, and Dimmy Lacey was another famous fighter. So he joined Dan Breen's lot. And, um, and so was part of a kind of guerrilla force in Tipperary, fighting around the towns and in the hills. Um, he, he, he was wounded in an ambush and he was, uh, they got him to hospital and he was under an assumed name um, and assumed backstory of being a farmer in Tipperary. Um, but he was unmasked in the course of his treatment because the bishop visited and he, he was determined to, to know the story of each of the men and uh, to give them a blessing. So the bit he fixed on not, was not the fact that he was meant to have fallen on a, a, hay, a hay knife. He, he was meant to have fallen and cut himself on a hay knife. Um, but he wanted to know, um, was the area he came from part of his diocese, or was it part of the neighboring diocese? And to pinpoint it, he asked him, well, who confirmed him? Which bishop confirmed him? And of course, he hadn't a clue. Um, and the matron, who was part of Common the Mon, a support for the Republican, the female support, she said, um, well, he fell and hit his head when, you know, and he's a bit confused. Um, and the bishop accepted that, but there were three free state officers in beds opposite uh, to where to his bed, and um, they knew right well he wasn't confused. So they, they they indicated that he would be picked up very shortly. So he had to be rescued from the hospital. So he had an exciting time during the civil war for an eighteen year old, um, and then he he eventually. Uh, the momentum was with the free state forces because they had the resources, etc. And they were squeezed into a smaller and smaller area. And eventually he was picked up at the end of the civil war, um, coming out of a dugout in the Glen of Aherlow with a rifle and ammunition. So he was court-martialed and of course he got a death sentence because he both had changed sides and he was found with, um, with an hour. And ammunition, and um, and again he had a narrow escape because in the prison four of them were kept in the guard room. On a stormy night, they managed to. They had been working on the roof overnight for some time, and they managed to get through the roof and with sheets and blankets tied together, got over the perimeter fence and escaped. And he went up the the. Uh, Sleeve and Mon is called a mountain close to uh, Clonmel, and um, he was taken in by an old lady there 
who found him shoes. They, of course, they had no shoes. They were running sort of barefoot up, up the mountain. And uh, she took him in for a while. And, and then he and a companion made their way back home to their own districts um, on the run. So they were on the run and wanted. There was a poster up for them. And he spent several years on the run because I haven't got time to go into the stories, but he ran into conflict with Gardy and he stole Gardy's clothes at one stage. And he had a run in with another pair, and there, so there was a warrant for arrest out for him. So he was a bit longer on the run than other people. When the amnesty came, some people were able to come back home, but he had to stay away a bit longer. So he came back to mining after all that excitement at age. 19. Yeah. And um, so when he arrived, he arrived as a, a revolutionary socialist, you would say. And so you say, so where did he get these ideas? Well, he had Connolly's ideas for a start. But uh, there was also a left wing faction within the IRA. And um, they were socialists, communists, all variations of left wings. And particularly somebody like Padre O'Donnell was, was a well-known one in Ireland, who was part of the IRA, but he was also a, a socialist, a uh, communist too. And he had, he worked with the, the Donegal small farmers, encouraging them not to pay annuities to the state, because they had to pay for the land that, that was distributed to them. So he, he got a movement going. His ambition was to have a small farmer worker republic. And that appealed a lot to my father because he was a small farmer. As the eldest son, he would inherit the small farm. And of course, he was also a miner. So, um, so that was a, an image, he, an influence that was important to him also. And of course, they had the, the Russian Revolution, the example of that of what could happen, how change could happen. The other big influence, of course, was, was what he found when he came back to mining. And of course, he found that nothing had changed in the mines. So nothing had changed. Conditions were the same. One is sort of still as intransigent as ever. Um, uh, and so he was determined that he would do something about that. Um, and this is a quotation from himself, where he said, uh, when he came back, he said, the wages were appallingly low, conditions were revolting, the men's spirit was broken after having a long period of suppression and defeat. And so they set about organizing a workers' revolutionary group. Now, this is a really interesting banner here, because it was found... Um, in the bottom of a cupboard in my father's house by uh, his daughter-in-law years and years later. And uh, it was from that period, 1930s, the only surviving one. Yes, and you can see there, it's Castle Colmer Workers' Group, the Irish Revolution Workers' Group, Free Ireland, Free the Working Class, James Connolly, all the message in, a, in one banner. So, um, they began to think about setting up, and this is obviously his influence with the people he had met while he was on the run. He knew about the Revolutionary Workers Group and he was thinking of setting it up. And uh, while they were beginning to work on that, um, they, it was known that there was going to be a big conference in Moscow in 1930, in August 1930, a Red International of Labour Union Conference. So the miners were determined that they were going to send Nixie to Moscow to find out what the revolution had achieved. Uh, they, they were nothing if not ambitious. Now this is rural Ireland, you know, quite isolated area. Um, so they raised enough money to send him and he was meant to go with, uh, with a group called Friends of the Soviet, of Soviet Russia. Um, but the, the, uh, the state wouldn't give him a passport to go. 
because they they had you know got intelligence that it was a bit dangerous, uh, so they wouldn't give him a passport. Um, anyway, he stowed away on a ship um, that that was carrying cement to Russia um, to get to, to this conference. And, and of course, the, the ship was blown off course, and he ended up in a part of Russia he <laughs> yeah. uh, hadn't anticipated, let's say. So he had to make his way across land to Moscow to, to the conference. So weren't they resourceful? And, uh, and he was really excited to meet all the, the sort of labor leaders of the day, the, you know, the Scottish mine workers, uh, union leaders and the Welsh and the English, um, and and leaders from around the world to hear the stories from around the world. And of course, they got updated on the five-year plan, and they were told that uh, it was ahead of schedule, and uh, they had a short working week, and um, wages were 167% higher than they had been in the pre-war period. Um, they had medical facilities paid for by the enterprises. Uh, everything was extremely rosy. Um, and their image of, of uh, what a trade union, they also gave them clues how to organize, uh, instructions as to how they should organize. Uh, and their ideas were centered on, say, one union, one enterprise rather than multi-enterprise, like the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. Um, that, was the, that was the current thinking in Moscow at the time. Um, so they found all of this uh, really interesting and exciting, the social changes, mining, in, in mining, for example, they had hot showers and baths when they came up from uh, from the mines, they had uh, canteens to give them food. They had drying facilities and washing facilities for clothes, so they could change into clean clothes. All of this, you know, very, very interesting changes. Um, okay, not only did they sort of explain how they should organize, uh, but they encouraged them to, to travel around Russia. Oh, I should have moved my slide. They encouraged them to travel around Russia and um, to see how their policy and practice. So he set out for a few, on a few months, travel around Russia, and he went to the Ural Mountains here to, to see so the industrial area, yeah. And then on to Samara to have a look at um, agricultural collectives were being formed in that area. And then he went over to uh, the Ukraine, to the Donbass region, to look at mining. Um, so he picked up quite a lot of what was going on in Russia at the time, and uh, also visited the Lenin School. Uh, where young Irish activists were being trained to go back to Ireland and uh, set up revolutionary workers groups uh, that would form the basis of a communist party in Ireland. Okay, so he came with his head full of all of that, these ideas back to uh, his local area. And of course, the intelligence services were quite alerted as to what had gone on and were waiting for him. So he was taken off the bus as he arrived in the in the, down near Castle Comer and um, taken to the Garda station to be interrogated. And the miners had come out to meet him, you see, off the bus. So they all surrounded the Garda station and they, um, they protested loudly until they released him. Uh, so they released him and he began to fill them in on all of that had happened to him, the exciting times and ideas that he had uh, come back with. And they began to plan their next move, which was to set up their own union. So they began to set up what's called the Mine and Quarry Workers Union. Um, and they had help from, uh, from Rob Stewart from the Scottish Mine Workers Union, who came and gave them advice as to how to set it up. And also, um, he gave them a constitution 
the, the Scottish Mine Workers Union's constitution to help them with their union. Um, now these developments, as you can imagine, uh, caused consternation back in, uh, especially in relation to the church, but also in relation to the, the landlord and the state. So you have this triple alliance uh, of attack on, on the union. And uh, it started with um, Father Kavanaugh was the local parish priest. So he did a round of the schools telling them about the dangers of communism. Um, and then he went around all the miners' families and um, encouraged, encouraged, told them not to allow their sons and their wives and their husbands uh, to join the union. Um, and uh, and the, the mine owner refused to nix a job, but the, the miners elected him as Czech weight man. Um, and that was a position that was paid for by the miners themselves. It was checking the weight of the coal to make sure that they weren't uh, exploited. And so, so he kept his position of influence within the mines. Um, that helped a lot with the organization. Um, and then there was a media war, of course. Uh, the, a Father Coleman in, um, in Kilkenny City was very anti-communist. And um, he, he set up a lecture tour uh, in the diocese, um, principally getting people who were exiled from Russia because of the revolution to speak and talk about the risks and the dangers and the oppression and the awful happenings in Russia. And their particular concern, of course, was, was um, suppression of the church. Um, and um, the newspapers took up the debate. So there was actually, I, was, I found it extraordinary, the extent of the debate in the particularly Kilkenny newspapers, Kilkenny people and journal, um, where uh, people wrote in and the miners responded. My father was answer, would answer all of the, the allegations that would come up. He explained the difference between mining there and in Castlecomer and the drudgery of the women in Castlecomer who had to, to, to wash and dry filthy clothes in front of an open fire, you know, in time for the man to go back to work the next day. And whereas you had these developments in Russia, the, the, the civilized approach to, to mining and the length of their working day and their exploitation. This was all explained in detail in responses in the newspaper. Um, and they, they said he was a fool, of course, absolute fool. The, the, the miners were just ignorant. Um, they, they, they were shown the best, he was shown the best bits of Russia and she would respond, well, I wasn't blindfolded. You know, I actually could see what was going on. There was a lot of uh, interesting debate went on at the time. Uh, in which they faced up, the miners were fantastic, really, the way they faced up to, to, to all the allegations that came hammering at them. Um, and it's an example of uh, one of the, Sogart is the, is the Irish name for priest. So they rarely gave their real names. Um, so this was his contribution on the newspaper. Our beloved laborers whose fate is dearer to them than life. However hard the lot of the poor, they have the grand Catholic faith to sustain them. They live on the hope, and this is a soothing balm to their souls, that God will one day take them to his bosom and wipe all their tears away. And so my father said, uh, did he consider that the hungry would be consoled by the thought that although they remained hungry and cold, they would be happy forever in the hereafter? And their employers, employers eternally punished. Surely, he said, religion is not incompatible with a decent livelihood. Um, yeah. So then they went on strike and they, they lasted six weeks on strike. And of course they hadn't resources behind them. They were, you know, a little rural union. Um, uh, but they did get support from the communist group in, in Dublin particularly, and um, Jim Larkin Jr. 
I forgot to tell you, when he visited the Lennon School, Jim Larkin's son was one of the people who, who was in the Lennon School. Um, and Sean Murray, who was also, uh, he had been part of the IRA from Donegal, was in the Lennon School. So he met, they were allies uh, when they came back. So Jim came down, Jim Jr., and he addressed the miners in the square in Castlecomer, encouraged them to keep going and uh, encouraged the community to support them. Uh, and, um, uh, and my father gave a speech to them as well, so that they, and this is where they carried that banner, you know, in, into the town of Castlecomer. Padre O'Donnell brought bread down from Dublin, and he also addressed the crowd and encouraged the farmers to have solidarity with the miners uh, in their battle. Anyway, um, the shopkeepers intervened and they got behind, they went to Monasford and they said, look, everybody's on their knees here, give some concessions. So he gave a little concession of a rise in wages to the miners. And it was indeed quite a modest victory, but they were delighted because it was a victory. Um, and they began to talk up their achievements. And of course, the Workers' Voice published all of their achievements and all of their grievances. And, um, and uh, so it was time, you know, they were getting a little bit cocky. So it was time to bring in the heavy guns. So they invited the bishop to come to the local area, to the local church. Um, and the miners church was Moaning Row um, on a little hill. So the bishop came out to Moaning Row to, you know, deal with this union business. And uh, the guardy were out to, as if he might be at some risk uh, to protect him. And there was a line of um, ardent church supporters uh, the, that uh, stood at the door of the church to prevent the, mi the miners' leaders going in. And of course, um, a, a line of miners. Most of these, I have to say, were probably still dissident members of the old Republican group. Um, and a line of them just stood behind the church protectors and uh, one of them had a gun in his pocket and he said the first one to go near bore and i'll drop him he said and so <laughs> they didn't move they let them go into church but then of course the bishop um he went to town on them in the church so he he um denounced communism he said they were paid by russian gold he said that uh, my father was an agent of course of the devil and that uh, the, the, their union, the uh, Revolutionary Workers Group, the Workers Voice, uh, and, and I gather my father was in the mix of all of those, uh, were agents of the devil. And then he, he, he asked them to renounce, to uh, renew their baptismal promises. And part of the baptism promises, of course, to denounce Satan and all his works. And since he had listed that they were all Satan's works, they stood up and they walked out of the church. Um, and he followed this up with a pastoral letter in 19, January 1933, in which he made it clear that um, he said to that they were being... Um, dishonest and cynical by attending church and also by be aspiring to be communist. So he said, no Catholic can be a communist, no communist a Catholic. For the former professed communist, any attendance of church or sacraments, a mockery, a sacrilege, a profanation of holy things, and must not lead people astray. Um, and this was seen as, he put all of them under a ban of the church, as he called it. This was seen as a writ of excommunication for the miners' leaders. And of course, that was a killer blow in the local community because it was a very Catholic community uh, uh, that uh, 
tended to believe what the bishop said, uh, and, and if he was so definite about this, well, he must be right, mustn't he? And uh, so it caused huge divisions within the, within families, between families, within the community, or marches through the mining area, etc. And it killed the union off. Um, so there you have it. They had failed again. They had failed. Um, the union was gone. Uh, and this, I think, this quotation captures the disappointment of that failure. As I said, the planter could never have broke, the planter, of course, was Wormsford, yeah, could never have broken the power that had defeated him, the organized strength of the Irish Mine and Quarry Workers Union. But he had one card up his sleeve, the card that had never failed, the card that was played in the 18th and 19th centuries. The planter saw his friend, the parish priest, the parish priest saw the bishop. The bishop came to the mining village Bell, book, and candle would succeed where six weeks' hunger had failed. The miners' union was to be stamped out. The Irish Transport and General Workers' Union was the menace of 1913. Of course, the church didn't support them then either. The miners' union and communism are the menace today. So you can feel his disappointment. Um, so what did they do? Well. They decided that the revolution wasn't coming any day soon in uh, in Moline Road, Castle Coma. That uh, so they formed a separate branch of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and this this is the committee uh, that formed. They were the ones that formed the first union and that went in as a branch to the second union. And um, this one here is my father. See, and this is the one that was supposed to have the gun in his pocket. <laughs> uh, so they were an amazing group of men, and uh, that uh, negotiated really difficult times. But the Irish Transport and General Workers Union was really generous in welcoming them, the welcome, welcoming them in. Yeah, they really invited, they were very good to them, allowing them to be a separate branch and uh, putting resources behind them in their battles in the mines. Um, and this is what they didn't have prior to this, but they did with the Irish Transport General Works Union. So they set about, okay, tackling the things they had wanted to, to tackle with their own union. Um, and lo and behold, in in 1939, they succeeded in getting baths and drying facilities, which made a huge difference to the lives of the miners. In 38, they managed to get, they persuaded Wormsford negotiate, to negotiate a deal with them to get coal at the cost of production. So they didn't have to pay the market price for coal for their own use. So that was another huge advantage to them. And then they, they decided on some bigger issues that they would go on strike. Um, so in 1940, I uh, won't go to, into this in too much detail, but it was always an issue for miners, what constituted a ton of coal? And in general, they were paid for what was called clean coal which was coal that had a certain quality of anthracite. This was anthracite mine, a certain quality and certain size. And the smaller quantities of coal, those that passed through a one and a quarter inch mesh, they weren't paid for. So they, they were sold on the market, but the miners weren't remunerated for, um, for digging that coal out. So that was a real grievance. You know that that they they fought hard um, for eleven weeks, and they succeeded in getting a formula which included some of the um, of that smaller type of what was regarded as waste, but of course it wasn't waste. Yeah. Um, then in 1943, uh, the, the government decided it was during the war, of course. The, the government decided to impose a wage freeze on the Deer Park mine, um, because it was the biggest mine in the country. 
Um, and the, 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 the miners were furious because their wages had always been um, connected to what they called a sliding scale. So as the price of coal went up on the market, uh, the miners' wages would be raised by a certain amount per ton. Yeah? Uh, when, when the price went down, their wages would be adjusted similarly downwards. But when it came to uh, 1943, of course, the price of coal went soaring on the market and their wages were frozen. And there was a lot of sympathy within the community. You know, they, they sort of, uh, they felt, well, this is unjust. You know, there's inflation, the wages count for little. Uh, and there was an, an added insult in that new mines that were brought into production during that period or old mines that had restarted because of the demand for coal, they didn't have a wage freeze. So wages, they were paid better in those mines than the deer park miners. It was very strange. So even one is for the mine owner didn't approve. He didn't approve for different reasons. He thought they were raising, you know, they were raising the costs of production and that would impact on him and create aspirations from the miners, etc. Um, so they decided they would stay down underground for a week um, to make their point. So they went down on the ground and, uh, and because there was a good lot of sympathy in the community, like the pubs brought them something to keep their spirits up and the farmers brought them straw to take down the mines to, to sort of sit on. And um, the shopkeepers brought them candles and community brought them food. Uh, and they entertained themselves with stories and music and card playing and the rest for a week. But they began to be, get ill by the end of a week. So they decided or were persuaded to come over ground, to continue the strike over ground. Anyway, they forced an inquiry and the, the inquiry uh, found for the miners against and the minister for industry and commerce was furious they, the miners had fought a huge talk about media battle contesting everything they 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 uh, questioned every statement he made and clarified it and put their position truthful position to it. so he did that they were very open they were amazingly smart about how they went about organizing uh, so they they won that strike and their wages were adjusted upwards. And also they won um, an agreement that uh, wages would be standardized across the coal sector uh, through other mines as well. Now their major strike then was 1949. And um, here again was the issue of the sliding scale. It had never been reintroduced after the war. And of course, by 1949, the price of coal on the market was very high and the profits of the companies were, was extremely high. And it wasn't being reflected downwards in the wages. So they decided they would go on strike. They were also concerned about certain categories of workers had a very poor deal, where maybe colliers got a good deal because they were at the coal face and kind of specialist workers. Um, other categories, particularly young workers new, new into the industry, weren't properly protected or, or didn't have, um, weren't properly remunerated for the early years. Um, so they wanted to engage all the outstanding issues during the strike. Um, and it became very bitter. They again, uh, the parish priest of Castle Comer accused them of being influenced by communism. And uh, my father said, I don't care what ism you put on the end of what we're meant to be doing, but we're staying out. We don't care. Yeah, we're staying out. Um, uh, the union was very supportive in this case. And decisions at the time were made by the Labour Court. So the employers went to the labor court, the unions went to the labor court, representatives of the employers and of the workers went to the labor court and they decided, looking at the evidence 
of who was in the right or in the wrong. Uh, and at one stage, they actually came down to Castle Comer, the Labour Court, to, to listen to the miners. And they all put their various positions uh, to uh, the Labour Court, uh, very coherently, I have to say. Um, um, the Labour Court found against them. <laughs> And they decided they weren't going to go back. They still wouldn't go back. And luckily, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union were actually a bit disillusioned by the Labour Court at this stage. They were finding that some of their decisions um, they they didn't agree with. Um, so they they supported the workers uh, taking the stance that they did. Then the employers tried to negotiate with each category of workers separately on condition that they went back. So they give a good offer to one category and then they said they would deal with the rest after. They said, no, we won't go back. And they, coming up to Christmas, they gave a, a very attractive offer for workers to come into work before Christmas on condition that they would continue to work afterwards. And they said, no. I wouldn't go back. And they put on a bus to take people from around the district um, in case they, they couldn't cycle, you know, in front of the other workers, etc. Um, and nobody went on the bus. They called it the ghost bus. <laughs> and uh, so there was a lot of bitterness. And then they discovered that, that actually the, uh, there was a big deal done with a sugar company in Carlo. Uh, the company had, had uh, were making huge extra profits that hadn't been declared. And one of my father's contentions always was that they looked at, they never looked at the profits of the companies, they looked at the cost of production. Um, uh, so they didn't take the whole story into account. So that was their argument. So that, that, that really influenced it when they leaked all of this information out. And in the end, they were so intransigent um, that they won every aspect of their case, 100% across the board. Now, they were absolutely delighted. Uh, they were more than satisfied with the agreements they got. And of course, that um, hastened in an era, you say, of prosperity for them. You would say the next 10 years was a good time for the miners of Castle Comer. And uh, that's um, Nick Say there. He was elected to the, Irish, the executive of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, probably on the back of all of this action, and um, the Congress of Trade Unions. So he decided at that point, well, now's the time to start working for legislative change, something that will change conditions for everybody. Um, and they started, they had been going on about the miners' disease, disease called pneumoconiosis, you know, lung disease, um, for years since they joined the union. Every conference they raised it, you know, representatives of the miners raised this issue. Um, uh, but they finally succeeded. Uh, he put such pressure on in every direction. Uh, both at Congress level and at union level, uh, that they got it uh, included in mining legislation in 1956. So it became an industrial disease and, and liable to compensation, etc. Then they got uh, additional holiday entitlement, entitlement in 1963 uh, because they were working in dangerous conditions, etc. And a big one in 1965 was the inclusion of, of um, safety at work. The mines were included in safety at work and legislation. Um, this made the owners liable for conditions within the mines. And I thought it was frightening when I looked at some of the, the data of injuries in the mines, you know, while I was researching uh, the book on my father. It was just amazing. It, they seemed to take it for granted that, you know, every miner had crushed fingers and broken arms and broken legs and knocked heads and back injuries. And it, 
was a taken for granted issue as being part and parcel of the job almost, you know. Um, so that came in 1965. And of course, they also got a welfare agreement with a clinic in the, in the mines in Deer Park, which was another great achievement uh, of the miners. So having arrived at all of these achievements, um, and that's um, Nixie in Geneva. He was the first uh, minor, uh, not minor representative, worker representative uh, from Ireland to speak at the ILO conference in Geneva there. Um, okay, just as they had made all those gains, they got notification that the mines were going to close. Um, so they all went into action to try and keep them open for as long as possible. So they, my father leaned on the unions and the government, so they got grants and surveys and see if they could find more productive scenes. It had got increasingly more difficult to bring the coal to the surface because of distance underground, and the seams were increasingly narrower. And of course, there were all those alternatives in the market like oil and gas and that were far cleaner and more attractive and less dangerous. And um, so the heart of the government wasn't, wasn't behind it, but also it was expensive to, to mine the coal and never as competitive as coal uh, in, in England, Scotland or Wales. They always managed to produce coal uh, at a far more competitive price than, than Ireland could you know, because of their particular conditions. Uh, so they kept it going for another three years. And um, the government in that time gave incentives to industry to come into the area. So five new industries were, were set up in the area to help absorb some of the miners uh, when the mines closed. And they closed in 1968. And this is a picture of the same set of miners here. You can see some of the old friends. My father, that's Tom Brennan Rowe. Uh, I don't know where the Fitzgeralds were, but you see all those faces were in the beginning, in the first committee. Um, this was just about the time of the closure. Okay. So you'd say, oh, well, all that fighting and the mines closed. Um, but they were extraordinary. They did challenge, you know, they rose to the challenge of their day, didn't they? Um, they were extraordinarily, I would have said, uh, they became extraordinarily organized and informed and very good at putting their arguments in every circumstance and backing it up with fact. And it was their, their great sin, uh, strength. And I think their solidarity was their second great strength. Um, as some, uh, um, a miner's daughter, uh, the daughter of a miner who, who had been killed in, in the mine, um, said of my father, uh, he stood strong. But I'd say of all of them, they, they really stood strong. Because even in the 11 month strike, people who weren't unionized didn't break the strike. And they would have had to go and get employment elsewhere and goodness knows how they survived. You know, and when he was thanking people, he made a point of thanking them and, and the women who had put up with all of this for sort of 11 months. So there we are. Um, that was his life. And that, that's uh, the book I wrote about him. Okay. Any questions? Thank you so much. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, uh -huh. yeah, I didn't know much about that historic at all. I just always believed in him and about successful campaign and just all the things that I've learned about. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, I'll try and make sure everybody gets a chance to go to the place. Um, obviously, he's talking about the idea when he was obviously very involved 
they did yes they, obviously ireland has a, a small sort of mining sector but Arigna, um Arigna was a, a mining around roscommon leitrim that that area the borders of roscommon and leitrim they they have they probably had I made mean, sometimes worse problems because of um I think the owners of the mines there were, were even more intransigent than Wandersford was. So often there was a spin off to what the actions that were taken in Castle Colmer had implications for Leitrim. And and the surrounding mines, when they went on the underground the stay down strike as they called it, um, the mines around about also went out on strike. Uh, to support them, but they all benefited, uh, funnily enough, from the actions of the bigger group of miners. Um, and uh, he also unionized some of those mines around about. He became sort of a, a trade union official um, that, that tried to work. But he, he did, uh, his interest was really, I suppose, he was passionate about the miners, but also about workers in general. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and, and Britain, yeah, there were. Um, as, I, as I told, I mentioned, you know, when when he was in uh, Russia, he he uh, he met Bill Allen, who was the secretary of the Scottish Miners Union. And of course, he was, I mean, it was he that gave the constitution for, for the basis of their mine and quarry workers union. Um, and uh, Rob Stewart came down to help them organize, advise them, because he was a very astute organizer and told them what to expect. You know, he warned them the church now will come out, we're all guns blazing here. Um, and, uh, but he also encouraged them, he, he thought they had great prospects of expansion, uh, particularly to other sort of quarry workers and road workers. And they had begun to expand, they had begun to expand. But um, the, the church was mighty powerful yeah. at that particular period in time. And they pulled out the communist um, sort of label when they needed it frequently. And they got the state, well, they worked in conjunction, you know, yeah. Um, the church would bring out a pastoral letter to support state action, you know, like condemning the Republicans over the Free Staters. Um, the church's pastoral letter would say, uh, um, this is an unjust war. You know, in Catholic terms, that means it's not a legitimate war. There's a legitimate government that should be supported. And, and we were going to ban all, um, you know, priests are forbidden to give uh, sacraments or com hear confessions or marry or do anything with Republicans, you know, they can, they, they, uh, and, um, and if they do, if they're sympathetic, um, they can be demobbed, you know. So they would bring all their gun barrels well loaded into the battle and in support of the state and vice versa, you know, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so and now just to finish, the Welsh miners, there was a to and fro they used to attend, uh, a, a group of them um, went to Wales now, I'm trying to think of when was it, in the, in the oh, actually it was the 60s, just before the closing of the mines. They went to, uh, I think it was a conference in Wales, and I remember Tom Brimro telling me that uh, they were amazed because they mentioned that one of their leaders, whose name I can't remember right now, but they had mentioned to him, did, did he know him? And he said, oh yeah, I slept with him, with him in Moscow. <laughs> I think he meant they slept in the same room. <laughs> So they had, they had this background knowledge of each other, 
And of course, when he was part of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, the executive, they travelled a lot. They had a lot of interchange between them. And they had letters from this of support from the miners from Wales. And I think the Welsh miners, when they were in trouble, the Castle Cromer miners supported them and, and vice versa. You know, and they came to visit Castle Comer. Someone was telling me about the a trip they made over and they, they visited all the miners on the mines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was this interchange. Yeah. I don't think so much with the Durham miners. Um I haven't come across that. Um but uh certainly the Durham miners were brought over in the nineteenth century, which was interesting to impose, to, to kind of um, um, show them how to do deep mining. Well, of course, the locals didn't want deep mining anyway. <laughs> there, was a, uh, there was a lot of controversy at the time because it caused, they closed pits that were close to the surface and were ruined near the cultural land. So Wandersford was determined that he'd he'd, uh, he'd bring about changes, and the Jarrow mine was very deep, so it had to be deep mining, and they had the technology in Britain at the time. So he brought over um, workers from Newcastle to to work, or from Durham to to work uh, to to manage, let's say, the the um, deep mining the start of deep mining in, in um, the area. And of course it started with uh, Jarrow 1 and went up Jarrow 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and more on 7 the beginning of the 20th century. But that's where it got its name. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the Catholic Church and many priests seem to support the Republican movement uh, during the 80s and 90s, 70s. And the priests would write books in support of the on injustice, just as the SS and strikers, all that kind of thing. So it seems to have gone from one extreme to another. In the South, it seems to have been anti Republican. It depends what period you were operating in. It was it was very interesting. There wasn't time to go into it, but during you know when I was talking about the War of Independence, um, you have to you, you have to sort of think of the Catholic Church in Ireland going back uh, through colonialism slightly because they went through a very repressive stage during penal laws, for example, after Cromwell, right up to the beginning of the, of the 19th century, 1800s, I think, was about the beginning of an opening up to allow Catholics to practice. So before that, there was a, it was a hidden church, in a sense. You know, you had, um, the, the, the area I come from is called Massford. Um, and its name goes back to that period because they used to have ma- mass rocks. They were all hidden. Um, so the locals would know where to go, but it wouldn't be known to the authorities. And they would have had hedge schools. So the church came from that sort of a situation to, say, the 19th century, when you had Catholic emancipation, they were very, very active in the land wars at the end of the 19th century, um, in support, anti, anti-landlord, anti very anti-landlord. Um, and in the local area where I came from, there was one very radical priest who was mobilizing. Actually, he was very good with the miners as well. He tried to unite miners and uh, farmers in that period. The miners to help the farmers get land um, that they were paying, they were paying rent for at that particular period of time. And uh, the, the Land League to support the miners in the strike. That was the end of that. So that, that was kind of rare. But he was kind of rare. And when it came to the War of Independence, you had 
the vision. You had a local priest in Monin Road, for example, who was very pro-Republican. The one in Castle Cornwall was pro, uh, he, might, he was a pro Wandersford, a friend of Wandersford. Someone said, I think he, he was the son of a, an RIC, uh, you know, Royal Irish Constabulary um, officer. I think so. So, and he said when when two several people were killed in an ambush, he said that they got what they deserved. They should have gotten more. It would have been his. So you had that division, a lot of support for the war of independence. When it came to the civil war, it switched. It seemed to switch, and it switched with people like. Um, although De Valeria was on the Republican side initially, uh, he was never he was never left wing. Never he was would have been to the military side of the IRA, very much right wing, very Catholic, very farmer kind of small farmer orientated. That would have been the people who supported him. Um, so. It varied. They certainly weren't in support of, they wanted to get behind the free state. Now, it might have been um, thinking along the lines, we've already, you know, at least we've got independence in most of the country. Um, that was De Valera's thinking, you know, afterwards. Um, well, it was Collins initially. Collins said, you know, get independence first and then you can work around the rest. Um, De Valera went against that to some extent by supporting the Republicans, but ultimately that's how he did it because he went into politics and, you know, he chipped away at any other links with the UK, like the uh, the ports, for example, control of the ports. Uh, he just got rid of it. He got rid of annuities. Um, so he acted in a sort of different way, but he kept the Catholic Church very much on side. Now in Northern Ireland, I suppose they saw themselves as defenders of the Catholic population. I, I would have thought that's where a lot of it was coming from and, um, and the fact that uh, I suppose they felt they weren't getting a whole lot of justice or integration in, in Northern Ireland. Um, very complex. As we all know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So two questions, please. First of all, what do you mean by internationalism when the Irish are coming into power? And if not, no. So that they will be angry against the people who own it. So they all stay in by that. They do, the, yeah. So the people who carry on owning it will be basically used. Yes. It was interesting, wasn't it? Because the Wallace family had been in Ireland from, as I said, the 17th century to, but they were very firmly had a leg in the camp of Ireland and a leg in the camp of North Yorkshire, Kirtlington. Their family home was in Kirtlington. And I visited, we went on holidays uh, earlier in the year. After I was dying to go and visit uh, Kirtlington. Um, and the ch church there had had plaques all around the walls to the Wanneser families who had lived in Castle Colmer. Now, for most of the par part of their history, say for the first two centuries, maybe they were absentee landlords. Mm -hmm. They had a big house in Castle Colmer, which they occasionally visited, but um, they had an agent who let the land and they had principal tenants who sublet and uh, complicated situation um, and so they they really began to take up residence in the 19th century but they still had that education in Britain and the, most of them were buried in Kirklington yeah um, and of course they were non-catholic within a very catholic community now they brought over over a lot of um, uh, Church of England people, a variety of religious 
actually uh, when the ones that came over they invited them i think hoping to to dampen down the catholic element to some extent um so so there was a certain diversity in this particular area but it seemed to be a mix of non-catholic groupings like um there was church of ireland most definitely and, and they had their own very established churches and uh, and then there was um i think baptists we used to call them dippers i don't, I don't know these are dippers baptists um and there seemed to be uh, sort of quite a number of variations within the sphere of, of say protestantism uh, in the area oh they held on to well they had all held on to the mines right up to the end he was very generous the last Henry Richard Pryor Womersford um, and his son, well, it was his son, I guess, was Captain uh, Dick, I think they called him. Um, uh, you know, they, they, owned, they owned all the housing around, of course, and uh, they had owned all the land. And, you know, if you counterpose, I could have shown you a picture of their massive big house. And the lifestyle was just so different from the lifestyle of ordinary people. Um, you know, they had hunting parties and they had um, an area that was part of the big house that was kind of had deer and, uh, you know, all these animals and they had lakes, you know, leisure activities and all of that. And they would have kind of their circle would come to a hunt every now and then. And, uh, and the, you know, the locals, would be fined or imprisoned if they, you know, stole anything off their land. <laughs> yeah, I think my father ended up in court one time <laughs> because uh, himself and his friend, his he, uh, his wife's brother actually, and they were very good friends. So they used to go off hunting. Right? They had guns, and. Uh, <laughs> they were caught on one occasion actually. Uh, I don't think his eyesight was very good, but he was, he thought he was shooting at a deer, I think, and he actually shot my uncle. <laughs> so he arrived with several pellets. <laughs> yeah, he moved, they were separated, you see, so, and he had bad eyesight. I can only put it down to that explanation because they still remained friends. <laughs> but they did end up in court. Um, because uh, on another occasion they, they were caught. I think the uncle had a, a dog that uh, they used to take hunting. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the guy who was the gamekeeper came out upon the scene. And of course, the boy is around. Um, but the, the dog stayed. So the dog led him <laughs> home. <laughs> Uh, and um, Mick was in bed, you know, pretending when when the gamekeeper arrived. So she tried to, but his wife tried to say, "Oh, he hasn't moved." And well, how come this? I found this dog, and he led me home. Oh, that dog is following anybody. <laughs> he wasn't having any of it. So apparently, they, uh, my father gave a speech in court in court about. Uh, colonialism and you know all of that sort of thing <laughs> yes they were, they were uh, i think the last one was very passionate about mining you know i, I was told stories about he gave he very generously sort of gave the deeds of some mines to uh, somebody i met to talk with an ordinary bloke was very interested in mining he could have sold them for a fortune or he could have done what he liked, but he gave them to this guy to use in order to find, we say, prime sites for getting coal, you know, for minor mining, as it were. You know. so, little, so this guy set up a little enterprise with a few friends in which they, they would mine coal and sell it on in the neighborhood. So he was generous and, and he would turn up at the works and would sort of be very interested in what they were doing and, um, and stuff like that. And he was the only one that let, stayed in Ireland. 
he, he, he lived out his life in Carlo, which was nearby, whereas all the rest went, went back to the went to England and moved out. Yeah, yeah. And eventually, I think that the house was burned down. Well, they, I think it was expensive to keep, you see, so they let it run down and then took the roof off. It was pretty beautiful house, absolutely beautiful. And beautiful grounds, yeah. And of course, they founded Castle Comer Town. You know, they were the, the founders right back in old Christopher One's day. Uh, it was um, burned down in one of the rebellions and they rebuilt it again. I tell you, they survived several, lots of rebellions and had to flee a couple of times, but they always came back and they held on. Yeah. Yeah. The banner survived. It survived. Is it? It is, yes. It is. It is an amazing banner, yes. It's a, it's a bit of a dilemma what to do with it, really. You know, because as I say, it's the only surviving one. It needs a bit of restoration as well. It's got very faded. But, but, and people's history, people's history, and they haven't conserved others. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a collection here at the library. Really? This is a one there. Yeah, I don't know. Really, do they? Yeah, they're handy, actually, here in the library as well. So they'd be a good place to start in terms of just asking for. Yes, I'd love to. I have sort of tried to look up online, you know, if there's any place where it could be. Before it gets any worse, you know. Conservation studios with the other bodies there. Yeah. Quite a lot of text down, or PHM. Yeah. Uh, they're just they're just they're just batting that direction. And they're oh, going okay. They are uh, they have studio where they have the banners. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. 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 And I know that my colleagues are making coffee because they keep messaging me saying, "Where are you?" So there's tea coffee over in the library, um, and if you could just like think about how to get hold of the book. Just in getting a coffee. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you look here, I mean, you might be able to see it. Uh, see geography publications? Say that again, sorry. Geography. Geography okay. publications. Um, what I want to do is put a link on the YouTube video. I'll put a link to the YouTube video. Yeah. And, and it's Dublin. Yeah. yeah. Geography publications Dublin, and uh, they send them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're very fascinated. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. I can't get this without the computer. But, um, uh, so edit however you like. <laughs> I will, yeah. Just the chatty bit. I'll, the questions are brilliant. So I'll Lovely meeting. The... <laughs>